Okay, here is video number two um, in my um, videos for my month of honesty about my um, living with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Um, and I thought um, that I should probably explain how I got my diagnosis. For someone with EDS, this is um, one of the biggest hurdles um, that we'll deal with. Um, it's not uncommon for people to go years and years and years without diagnosis. Um, you know, I've known people who are, you know, over 40 and they just got their diagnosis. Um, it's that hard to diagnose, <laughs> um, when doctors don't know what it is. So, um... I, I was born with Ehlers-Danlos and I had been having symptoms since I was born, but because I was having symptoms since I was born, I didn't know that it wasn't normal. I didn't know that most people don't have their ankles just collapse on them or most people can't put their patellas on the side of their knee, you know, things like that. Um... And so, um, it wasn't until I hit about puberty, which is fairly common for this to be an issue, um, for us, um, that I started having problems that were getting significant enough, um, to know they weren't right. They weren't normal. Um, they were causing problems. Um, so, um, I had started dealing with joint pain and all of that kind of stuff, um, especially my knees. But, um, because of my age and the fact that I was going through puberty, it just kind of gets brushed off as it's just growing pains. Um, and that's another thing that's really common for people with Ehlers-Danlos. Um, things get pushed aside. It's just growing pains and people assume that we're just whining a little more. Maybe we have a lower pain tolerance when <laughs> it's actually the exact opposite. And so I was in sixth grade and... All of a sudden, over the course of like a few weeks, I went legally blind. I'm talking can't read the big E on the eye chart blind. Um, so we went to the eye doctor, go through this, all these tests that they you know, are able to do there. And my vision just kept getting worse and worse throughout the test. And finally, the eye doctor was like, um, we need to send her to Sacramento. We need to send her to Davis. And so, um, that was kind of where it all started. <clears throat> so we had an HMO and if you have an HMO, uh, I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, doctor wants us to go see this one specialist at Davis and have these certain tests done. <coughs> and, um, of course, HMO was like, no, no, no. We need to have you see this person first. So it sent me to a pediatric optometrist um, at one of the other hosp big hospitals down there in Sacramento. All these these visits that I'm going to talk about in this time period happened down at all the big hospitals down in Sacramento. Um, so go down there and you know, do the eye tests and all these different things. And like before, my vision got worse throughout the, the period of the exam. Um, and so couldn't get an eyeglass prescription established. Um, doctor's like, eh, I, this is, you know, weird. Um, so my eyes were dialing and everything at the end of the, you know, by the time we were done. And um, so I was sitting in a dark room and the doctor pulls my mom's side. Well, we leave the office and my mom is crying and so we go and we go shopping at the mall and we go have lunch and eat junk food. Um, and I found out the whole reason we left that she left crying was because um, the doctor had pulled her aside and accused her of Munchausen's by, by proxy. It's kind of hard to pronounce. Um, which basically means that um, she was doing something to me, whether it be physical or emotional, um, that was causing my vision problems. Um, and um, 
that a lot of times people do that um, as a way of getting attention and sympathy for themselves. Um, and, um, you know, she'd also get the question, well, how is your marriage? How are things at home? Because of course the status of my parents' marriage has everything to do with how my eyes work. So next doctor, still not going to the doctor that we were originally supposed to start at. HMO sends us to someplace else. Got some of the same kind of questions. Um, you know, how's your marriage? How are things at home? Is she overly stressed? Um, doctor after doctor after doctor. And finally, we eventually end up back where we were supposed to be from the whole beginning. Um, and so by, by that point in time, we were kind of at the, the end of the line as far as, um, you know, tests and stuff goes, as far as what these doctors could think of. Um, and so we finished the test, still same problems. Doctor doesn't know what's going on. So he says that, um, my eye issues were because of stress, AKA psychosomatic, meaning my symptoms are all in my head. Yeah. This is really big, common problem for not only people with Ehlers-Danlos, but other rare conditions as well. If the doctor doesn't know what it is, it can't possibly exist. It has to be in your head because if it wasn't, the doctors would know about it, right? The doctor knows things. They know everything. It can't possibly be something that they just don't know. So it's stress. So went home and started making arrangements kind of for the next school year, um, trying to figure out accommodations and, you know, all these things, you know, kind of, do we have to accept this is just reality. Um, and so, um, eventually things kind of stabilized a little more and we were able to get, um, finally able to get a prescription of glasses that would work for me so I could see. And well, during the time that I was struggling with my vision, um, I had started um, jamming my fingers and they would lock in what's called a swan neck deformity. I'll take these off because these stop it from happening. Um, give you a quick show. This is a swan neck deformity. Children, don't try this at home. And so I would bump them into something and then they'd lock like that. Um, and so we thought the problem was just because my depth perception was really bad. Well, we fixed the vision problem and the fingers are still a problem. So about this time, we get rid of the HMO. We get regular kinds of insurance, um, which also meant a change in my primary care physician. And so we go in um, to see this new doctor um, and we were gonna kind of talk about, I think, I think their fingers were on the agenda of things to talk about, um, but I think it was, we we're gonna get like, I don't know, a prescription for acne or something like that. Um, and so, um, mentioned the fingers, and um, my mom kind of mentions the, the issues that we had dealt with with the vision. And he was like, hmm, do your knees hurt? And my mom's like, yeah, she complains about them hurting all the time, but it's just growing pains, right? Um, and so then he basically runs me through what is called the Baton scale. Um, and it's a scale that's used to assess hypermobility and it's, um, one of the most common tools used in diagnosis. It's not the only thing used, um, for a diagnosis with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, but it's kind of, um, a starting point and runs me through that and um, then does something really weird. He pulls on the skin in the back of my hand and he's like, huh? He's like, well, um, I think I know why she had the vision problems. And he explained to me that, um, I had this condition called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and that, um, basically the connective tissue that was holding, um, the focusing muscle fibers in my eyes together um, was so stretchy and so lax 
that the focusing muscles um, during this you know, big growth change and all these things going on in my body, um, the focusing muscles were having to overwork um, to compensate for the bad connective tissue. Um, and so they would just fatigue super quickly. Excuse me. And um, wouldn't be able to compensate for it. Um, and so um, that was kind of the start of everything um, as far as um, having to adjust to this whole new reality. And, you know, now I know what's going on, but how do I live with it now? How do I prevent injuries? How do I do this? How do I do that? Um, at that point in time, um, wasn't aware of it, but I had a condition that's secondary to Ehlers-Danlos called POTS or post-orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Um, it wasn't until um, I got into high school when my symptoms started becoming a big enough of a problem that um, um, a cardiologist figured out what was going on. Um, and so just all these things getting um, getting to, I guess, be reacquainted with my health. Um, and even then, didn't know a whole lot about it. Um, at this point in time, um, it wasn't exactly like, now we have WebMD and all those kinds of things. So people go online to look up symptoms and disorders and diseases and stuff all the time. Um, that wasn't, at least for what I was aware of, um, that common of a thing. Um, and so I didn't really get into that until, um, I kind of graduated high school basically. Um, and pretty soon I learned that there was a lot of things going on with me that I just brushed off as normal or just a quirk or, um, was like, I'll, I'll just live with it, um, that weren't right and needed to be addressed and, all these things and um, as various situations would come up um, particularly um, emergency room type situations I would get doctors that um, first of all they wouldn't know what Ehlers-Danlos was or they're like oh I heard about that once in med school or oh that's that Bindi syndrome right but it always came back to doctors that do, did know about it or that at least googled it um, knew that um, it's typically diagnosed by a geneticist. So um, I would get doctors who were like, well, were you diagnosed by a geneticist? I was like, no, I was diagnosed by my primary care who had seen a patient with it before. And he was like, well, if you haven't gotten your diagnosis from a geneticist, you can't really know that you have it. Um, and so finally I was like, fine. And I was able to track down um, the genetics clinic at Stanford Hospital, and uh, I'm actually wearing a shirt I got there at one of my states, um, <laughs> and um, so I go in there, and um, I was actually at, in a wheelchair at the time that I went in there, and running through family history and my own history, um, figured out that um, my mom and my grandma had it too, much, much milder versions. Mine's considered severe. Um, but, um, was able to track it back several generations, um, and was also, um, given all this information, um, on what to expect, what things I needed to be doing, um, and, um, very overwhelming, but also an amazing feeling of, I'm not crazy. These things are real. It's not just this. It's not just that. It's not just a quirk. Um, it's, um, it's not in my head. This is real. Um, and so, yeah. And the rest is history, so to speak. Um, I was very, very lucky. Um, my primary care had had a patient with it before, so he knew what it looked like. Um, for someone with Ehlers-Danlos, when we find a medical care provider 
um, of any kind that has seen patients with Ehlers-Danlos before and knows what it is, recognizes it, has experience treating someone with it, um, it's amazing. It, like, makes our month, not just the day. It's, like, oh, exciting stuff. Um, so to get a diagnosis, um, it's really difficult. Um, things are, um, a little bit easier now. Like I was talking about, you know, the internet's a lot more, um, user-friendly as far as, um, getting medical information. Yeah, it does create, um, some, uh, issues for some people, but, um, when you have, these kinds of crazy symptoms to be able to go online, type out all these different things that are going on and have something come up that explains pretty much everything that's happening. Um, you know, it gives you a guide, um, where you need to go to get, um, your, your diagnosis, your medical information, um, from a a physician. And, uh, so yeah, very, very blessed in that regard. Um, so yeah. And, uh, I will talk to you guys later in my next video. Um, hopefully, um, within the next week or so, um, I'll have something more for you. And I really appreciate you guys taking the time to, um, listen to my videos because, um, it is difficult to get a diagnosis when nobody knows what's going on. Um, so it's really, really important that we get as much awareness out there as possible. Um, so not just the general public knows, but, um, you know, these physicians need to be taught more about this kind of stuff in med school. Um, and there needs to be more funding for, um, the research and because we're considered rare, we don't get hardly any funding for research. Um, so that's definitely a need. So.